Hello, and welcome to the Method Space Live webinar, Joint Display Analysis for Mixed Methods Research, hosted by Janet Sammons with guests Michael D. Fetters and to Shane Haynes Brown. This is Michael Todd. I'm the Social Science Communications Manager at Sage Publishing, and I'd like to begin by introducing our panelists and our hosts. But first, this one hour webinar will be recorded and it will be archived for future viewing. We will be sending out a link to view it and to access the slides to all registrants in the coming days. And the recording will reside at the website methodspace.com. So to repeat, it will be recorded and you can view it later. Now our host today is Janet Sammons, the methods guru at methodspace.com. Janet is an independent researcher, writer, and consultant through her company Vision to Lead Incorporated. And she previously served on the graduate faculty of the Capella University School of Business. Janet's latest book, Publishing from Your Doctoral Research, is now out. Congratulations. And she has several titles published by SAGE, which is the parent of Method Space, including the forthcoming What Kind of Researcher Are You in SAGE's Little Quick Fix series and a new edition of Doing Qualitative Research Online. She is joined today by Tashane Haynes Brown a lecturer in teacher education at the University of the West Indies and president of the Mixed Methods International Research Association Caribbean chapter, and by Michael D. Fetters, a professor of family medicine at the University of Michigan. Mike is co-editor of the Journal of Mixed Methods Research and author of the Mixed Methods Research Workbook and the editor of the Sage Journal of Mixed Methods Research. And we will be offering a discount code for that workbook of Mike's at the end of the webinar. Now some technical things. If any of you have any problem with audio or viewing mode during the webinar, please use the Q&A box. It's probably on the right of your screen and one of our helpful team members will get back to you ASAP. At the end of the presentations, we will have time for some questions and answers from the attendees. So please also use that Q&A box to ask any questions of our guests. And feel free to post questions throughout the webinar, even if we're not, even if someone's still speaking, and we'll address them during the Q&A portion. And please also take note of the webinar hashtag, hashtag Method Space Live, and feel free to ask questions or leave comments there. And if we don't get to all the questions, we'll attempt to answer them after the webinar in print. Now, without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Janet. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the webinar. As you heard the uh, introductions after a brief overview, um, Mike and Shane will take it over and uh, have their presentations and some uh, dialogue about their work, uh, and then we'll open it up for some Q&A. So uh, first, let's see. We have, uh, since you can't see us on camera, uh, share uh, some photographs so you can see that, yes, indeed, there are real people behind the screens. And Mike, uh, Michael Todd mentioned Method Space, which is the host for this uh, event. Uh, and just if you aren't familiar with Method Space, I want to just uh, tell you that this is a blog community where we focus on all things to do with designing, planning, conducting, analyzing research. Uh, and then writing about it and sharing results in uh, various ways that might increase the impact of the study. And then at the heart of that, uh, we're concerned about teaching and learning. So we're looking at ways to uh, support uh, novice and student researchers and the faculty uh, who supervise and work with them. And so you'll find uh, original posts, interviews, open access resources on different themes uh, each month. So this month, our theme is on multi-methods, which uh, would be uh, more than one approach uh, using the same paradigm, as well as mixed methods that mix both qualitative and quantitative. And I really think that uh, we've kind of hit <laughs> this at a particular moment where you know we really need to uh, look at ways to use mixed and multi-methods because the problems are just so complex. Uh, we really need to look through not more than one lens and with more than one method and really even with more than one discipline. So as a contemporary example, um, we're immersed today with big numbers every day and you know when we hear about uh, the number of people 
who have been um, infected with the uh, coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, you know, what do those big numbers really mean? We hear those and see, hear them about them growing each day. Um, what do we want to know when we hear, you know, that kind of information? But might we have a different, uh, might you have a different uh, kind of impression if I told you about my daughter who is not the age who is supposed to be at risk, but was isolated in her room for a month uh, trying to breathe with her young son sitting outside the door coloring cheerful messages like you see here. With that kind of story, might you have uh, different questions than you would from the numbers alone? Uh, might you want to understand the outliers and the people who maybe aren't fully represented by the numbers? Uh, would you want you know, to find some way to understand both the scope represented by those big numbers and the depth from the stories of the people behind those numbers? So I think that mixed and multi-method research helps us uh, to dig more deeply and really get a better sense of what uh, you know, the full you know, kind of picture is and what, you know, what we need to know. So with that in mind, uh, I think it's also incredibly important to show what we've learned from that kind of research in ways that will help people to uh, understand the full uh, range of uh, implications. So uh, with that thought in mind, I'm uh, happy to introduce uh, Mike and Tashane who will uh, talk with us about their work conducting and, sh and representing mixed methods research. So Mike, take it away. Well, hello, everyone. It is an absolute thrill to be with you today. And I do want to express our uh, sincere thanks to Janet and Michael and uh, also Olivia, who's behind the scenes, and also my co-presenter, uh, to Shane. We want this webinar to be really uh, helpful to you. So our purpose is to help you get a better understanding of mixed methods integration using joint display analysis. So joint display analysis may be language that's a little bit new to you, and uh, it's a very exciting area in mixed methods research right now that you could use in your work in mixed methods. We're going to try and give you a little bit of, of uh, context about what that is, because even the word joint display may be new to some of you. We're going to, as far as process goes, illustrate how this is an iterative process uh, when you're conducting a joint display analysis. So you don't sit down once and create a joint display and analyze your data and you're done. It's really an iterative process. And we're going to illustrate that to you in uh, detail through a example of the incredible work that Dr. Uh, uh, that Tashane uh, Haynes Brown, Dr. Tashane Haynes Brown has been doing. So if we can go on to the next slide. So what is a mixed methods joint display? A mixed methods joint display is a table or a figure that represents with some kind of structural features, both the qualitative or the quantitative data collection. And in cases that can be the data collection procedures, or it could actually be the findings in a juxtaposed representation. So when we say juxtaposed, we mean that it's basically side by side, that the qualitative and the quantitative information are there together in a joint display. So let's look at what is actually a joint display. Uh, and I'm just briefly going to tell you about where the joint display that you're going to see next is coming from. It's from a study called the Adapted Study that used a joint display. And we were looking to find out what were key stakeholder perspectives about using a unique kind of trial called an adaptive clinical trial for looking at individuals who had had brain injury emergencies in emergency rooms. And so the, the data collection involved uh, survey and many focus group interviews where the surveys collected both scaled data as well as qualitative data. And then for the integration aspect, which is a piece many people are very interested in, we used uh, a joint display. So we merged in the joint display participant attitudes using the visual analog scales and qualitative interview data as well as free text comments that were from the survey. So we could now look at that joint display 
I'm going to orient you. Ah, I'm sorry. This is uh, actually what this instrument looked at. So it had scales like this. It was on online, and you could move a, a bar. This is called a visual analog scale. We gave people anchors for definitely not to definitely, and then we posed a question to them. So they had a question, and then they used the scale, and then there uh, was a open-ended question about what was the rationale for their response. Thank you. So now we can go to the next slide. So this is a lot to look at and take in. I'm gonna go through this slowly. Uh, so this is a joint display labeled with what the different components in a joint display are. So if we start on the extreme left, we see in the first blue box on the left, color coding by group access across the quantitative and qualitative data. So in other words, there's green, from the uh, attitudinal findings in those uh, in that first box match to quotes from specific groups. So the green match with a uh, consultant biostatistician group, biostatistician group, the brown match with clinicians, the purple matched with other key stakeholders, and blue match with academic statisticians. Now at the top we see quantitative findings presented using box plots. So in this particular joint display, we use a figure uh, to present the attitudinal findings. Uh, as we'll see in a couple uh, other iterations, you could also just use the uh, specific numbers. In this case, we used these uh, box plots. Now moving to the right a little bit, we see qualitative findings which are presented as quotes. And that area is labeled as illustrative quotes. And then we have those four, four different groups matching to each of those lines from the attitudinal findings. And then in the last column, we have uh, the meta inferences. So meta inferences is language used by mixed methods researchers to say, what is your interpretation and consideration of both types of data together? So when we look at what did the quantitative findings show, what did the qualitative findings show, what is our new interpretation? What are the meta inferences that we can draw from that? This particular joint display also has, uh, if you look at the bottom there, the box at the very bo bottom, the blue box, an indication of the source of the qualitative data. And so because there were both many focus groups and there were comments from the survey, you can see in the brown where that came from many focus group, and you can see in the very bottom in the bluish color uh, that that was from the survey. So this is again a, uh, cutting edge presentation of results. So let's go to the next slide. This is another joint display, which again, will, in this case, we'll start at the top. This was from a study where we were using a computer simulation to teach communication skills. And it was a blinded multi-site mixed methods randomized controlled trial. I don't really think the details are important, but I want to just introduce to you the overall structure of this. So this differs from the previous figure because we have a comparison group. We have the intervention arm and we have the control arm. So if you see at the top, those are marked out with uh, some bars there. And I apologize for my uh, notifications if those are coming through. Um, and then below those intervention arms, we see a series of columns that are identified by what were the constructs, what was the quantitative data for the intervention arm? What was the qualitative data for the intervention arm? And then we have for the control arm, what was the quantitative data and what was the qualitative data? And then in the last column, we see the meta inferences. So again, the meta inferences are allowing us to look across those findings. We look across the quantitative, the qualitative findings for the intervention arm. We look across what were the quantitative and the qualitative findings for the control arm and then draw a conclusion or an interpretation about what we learned from having both types of data together. Could we go to the next one, please? Joint displays have become very, uh, uh, you know, used in very flexible ways. This is a absolutely amazing joint display that was uh, created by Carolina Bustamante uh, and is published in the journal Mixed Methods Research, as you can see in the bottom. She's a teacher of Spanish, and she was using a uh, using TPAC, uh, which is a theory used in uh, teaching Spanish, uh, to develop a joint display in mixed methods research. And she used case study in her project. This is uh, called a circular joint display. It's theory driven from a case study. In the core, the area in the black, we can see how there are uh, 
uh, constructs from the theory that are linked to specific survey scales, and then they actually show uh, the, the significance of those. So you can see the statistical sign significance. So within those first three rings, we have the primary constructs of TPAC, and then you also see what were the scores on those. And then as we move outward, we see in a first ring qualitative themes, and then the second white ring, we have illustrative quotes, and then the outside ring, uh, you can see this in gray, you see different words like expansion, confirmation, uh, discordance, et cetera. These are actually looking at what is the fit. That is, how does the qualitative data and the quantitative data uh, match with each other? When you mesh it together, uh, do the, does the information give a, a expanded understanding? Does it confirm the understanding uh, through both sources of data? Or is there some discordance? Is there some differences in what those two types of data show? So hopefully that's a little bit it gives people a better understanding about the power and the uh, amazing flexibility you have in a joint display. Let's go to our next slide where we can now talk about what is joint display analysis. So joint display analysis is this process of identifying the linkages between the qualitative and the quantitative constructs through multiple iterations in a table or some other figure where we're putting the qualitative and the quantitative findings together and then organizing the structure to allow us to optimize our understanding of what those mixed findings are. So again, it's a process. It's not you just create one joint display. And the first joint display I showed you, we actually went through eight different iterations of that, major changes uh, before we came up with the final. And it was through that process that we realized that creating a joint display is analysis and that's where we coined this language of joint display analysis can we go to the next slide please so in the uh the workbook of uh, mixed methods research the mixed methods research workbook i introduced seven core steps in mixed methods data analysis and so this is a framework that can be used if you're doing a mixed methods study where we have to think about entering and cleaning the data, framing our analysis according to the study purpose, three, conducting some kind of preliminary analysis, using an organizational structure to summarize the findings, looking for inconsistencies in that information, organizing the information for dissemination, and then interpreting and writing up the findings and uh, sending those results out for peer review. So, when you're doing mixed method studies, people are often at a loss about how are you supposed to do this. And so when we talk about joint display analysis, if you could just hit next there, joint display analysis is actually covering uh, several of these steps. So we're using the joint display analysis for a preliminary analysis. We're using an organizational structure to look at our initial findings. We're then looking for inconsistencies or commonalities. And then we're all ultimately going to be organizing that information for uh, preparation for dis dissemination. And that could be in a dissertation, it could be in a publication, it could be for a presentation in a, uh, at a conference, even an online conference. So next slide, please. So this is a figure that we developed to um, illustrate how this is an iterative process of joint display analysis where we're starting looking in the upper left uh, corner here, uh, identifying themes and patterns, looking are there any anomalies in the results based on the findings of both data sets. So this is the key is that we wanna look at both types of information, the qualitative and the quantitative information. And then we have to decide on what is the most suitable numeric and text data to integrate together. And then we can start comparing and contrasting that quantitative and qualitative information. And in this case that you'll see briefly, uh, is about a case study where it was a qualitative case study. So again, we've got this pattern where we're going in a cycle. So once we started comparing and contrasting those, we can come back to identifying other themes or patterns or looking if we need to reorganize that. Do we need to create new variables from our quantitative data set that would account for the qualitative findings that are emerging. So it's very much an emergent process. Grab the next slide, please. So I. Uh, it gives me great pleasure, pleasure now to introduce my colleague, Dr. Tashane Haynes-Brown. Um, I'm used to calling her Tashane, 
Um, but she's going to be talking about her very interesting work uh, where she used uh, joint display in a mixed method study to understand how teachers' beliefs shape their use of information and communication technology in Jamaica. So would you mind taking over there to Shane? Thank you very much, Dr. Fetters. It's wonderful to share with you in this session. All right, so next slide, please. So this study was an explanatory sequential mixed methods design. And with sequential designs, the naming convention derives from the role of the quantitative or qualitative strand. So for this one, the quantitative strand was conducted first and based on the data from that quantitative phase, it then informed the decisions for the qualitative phase. And so we then did an overall interpretation based on combination of the quantitative and qualitative data. So those are the basic characteristics of an explanatory sequential design. And that was what we did in this study. So in terms of just giving you a basic idea of what the study was about, just to create that context for explanation. So in the quantitative phase, I issued 300 questionnaires to teachers for two reasons. One was to test the significance of beliefs in accounting for their use of technology. And we also use that questionnaire to explore the extent to which there was some alignment between their beliefs and how they use technology. Because a lot of things in the literature spoke about this alignment between your beliefs and your classroom practices. So we wanted to find out if that was also evident in the sample. Next slide. So based on this analysis of the, quanti the quantitative phase, there were some major results. First of all, using a path analysis, there was the confirmation of a positive and significant relationship between their beliefs and use of ICT. Sorry, ICT is the same thing as just technology in general, right? Just for ease of reference. And the model explained 48% of the variance in how teachers used technology. So that was important because it confirmed to some extent the conceptual framework that was utilized in guiding the study. So I actually tested a segment of my conceptual framework in this quantitative phase. The other significant result based on the findings was that there was in fact, next slide. Thank you. There was in fact some alignment between what teachers said they believed and what they reportedly did in their classrooms. But that was not the case for everybody in the study. So for the 300 teachers, there were some teachers, for 57% of the teachers, we found that their beliefs and their use of technologies aligned in either highly teacher-centered ways or highly learner-centered ways. While for another 43% of the, the teachers in this study, we found that their beliefs were, for example, reported as being highly learner-centered, but the practices they reported were highly teacher-centered. So, of course, these kinds of results had implications for how we would conduct the follow-up phase of this mixed method study. Next slide, please. So, based on these quantitative results, which confirm to some extent the existence of alignment between teachers' beliefs and use, and some that did not, we sought to explain these quantitative results with an aim to understand what our teachers' understanding of how their beliefs shape technology. So we wanted to get a deeper understanding of that. And we also wanted to, based on actual observations of teachers' classroom practices, find out how consistent are these reported beliefs based on the quantitative data with their actual classroom practices that we would observe. Next slide. So this resulted in our follow-up case study phase. So we decided to use three case studies to examine these questions. So we used multiple forms of data. We had semi-structured interviews. We had video recorded observations. There was also a quantitative observation checklist and video elicitation interviews. Now, each of these served different purposes in helping us to gain a better understanding of what was happening in terms of teachers' beliefs and how they were helping to shape their actual use of technology. Now, I must point out that if you look at this 
follow-up case study, it is not entirely qualitative. It actually utilizes some quantitative data, and this would reflect what we call an advanced or mixed method, an advanced explanatory sequential design with a mixed methods case study being used in this phase. So we had a total of nine teachers for this case study phase, and we developed three case studies. One case study was based on teachers who had reported highly learner-centered beliefs and use of technology. Another case study was being addressed looking at teachers who had reported highly teacher-centered beliefs and use of technology. And then we also wanted to understand those teachers whose beliefs and use of technology did not align. So we selected also three teachers from that category whose beliefs did not align with their use of technology. Why did we need to do all of this? To examine their understandings of their beliefs, to explore the extent of, to which those beliefs that we found on that questionnaire based on what they reported would have actually aligned or not aligned with their actual use of technology observed, and also to get a better understanding from them in explaining the quantitative results of how your beliefs would have shaped this alignment or non-alignment between what you say you believe and what you actually do in the classroom. So that was why this case study came about. So we decided, based on all the data collected in this case study phase, that we could use joint display analysis to analyze the case study because we had the quantitative data that came from observing the teachers and utilizing this checklist that was developed to rank and rate the teacher's pedagogic orientation in terms of teacher-centeredness and learner-centeredness. And we had our observation qualitative field notes that would actually give us greater detail of what exactly the teachers did in the classroom. So we recognized that there was a wonderful opportunity there within this case study phase to actually utilize joint display analysis. So we used that, that those joint displays to identify the teacher's pedagogic orientation, to provide detailed descriptions of the typical patterns that were emerging in terms of how the teachers use technology based on the qualitative field notes. And we also basically, all of that was being done to answer one of our research questions, which asked how consistent are teachers' use of technology with their stated beliefs. So this was how we utilized joint display within the case study phase. All right, so we went through several iterations in building our joint displays. And with each iteration, we learned something new about these case studies. And we also learned a lot about joint displays in this process. And I can tell you, I enjoyed every minute of it. And I know a lot of us struggle with choosing the right fit in terms of how to integrate our quantitative and qualitative data. And so here I'm going to show you just few snippets of the different phases we went through as we went through this, these iterations to build a joint display, some of the challenges we encountered. As a student at the time when I was doing my PhD with this, you know, I leaned on, on Dr. Fetters very heavily to give me advice and to ask the right kinds of questions. It got me thinking. And so my first, this was one of the first joint displays that I brought to one of our meetings. And this joint display that was created, what we had done in order to create this joint display, we took all the, we took the quantitative scores from the observation checklist and we calculated the scores for five, the five dimensions. So this quantitative checklist had five dimensions that were being captured in terms of organizing the teacher's pedagogic orientation. And we had observed these teachers over three lessons across six months. So we would go to the teachers at different time in the year to observe, video record, and also to utilize the checklist to rank and rate these different aspects. So what we had was five sets of scores and each dimension had three sets of scores because what we did was to have so for lesson one, we calculated the score for that aspect. Then the same score was calculated for lesson two, then the score for lesson three for each aspect. But what this did when we looked at the joint display that we had created was that the, in terms of the quantitative side of this, this was just representing one teacher. And so there were several challenges there. And you looked at the qualitative side, 
we had chosen exemplars for just two of the five dimensions that were part of the observation. So because of how we had done this with five groups of triple bar graphs for one teacher, it meant that in order for us to analyze the data from one case study with three teachers, we needed three joint displays looking somewhat like this. And so from this, we recognized that there were some challenges that were encountered. And this helped us to begin to refine our joint displays. Next slide, please. So what were the major challenges we encountered with this joint display that was created? First of all, the quantitative and qualitative data, both of them were being underrepresented, especially on the qualitative side. Five dimensions, and we only had two typical field notes sections out of five, right? The other thing we recognized was that this the case-oriented approach that was chosen in the design of the case study was lost in this early iteration of the joint display because this joint display only revealed the data for one teacher rather than looking at the case as a whole, right? And then the other thing we recognized as we looked at this joint display was that, hey, we weren't thinking about reader friendliness as we created this, because when you look at the bars, you realize we didn't have, make any accommodations for organizing the bars in terms of from high to low based on scores or low to high. We simply, as they were created, they were just put on the slide. And so the, the, we did not give enough consideration to reader friendliness in creating this first joint display. So of course, this would have led us into another iteration where we would try to correct many of these errors and the challenges that we encountered. Next slide, please. So this would be another iteration based on all these observations that we had made, the insights we gleaned in terms of the fact that the case-oriented approach was lost. So the first thing we needed to do here was to look at the scores for all five dimensions for all teachers within that case. So that meant that we would have to calculate average scores for all teachers per dimension within the case. So of course, that represented a, a, level of abs a different level of abstraction in terms of how the data was being represented quantitatively. But if you notice though, this joint display, the good thing about it, it dealt with all three teachers from the case. We had considered reader friendliness in terms of how we presented this data. So we organized the scores from high to low. And on the qualitative side, we ensured that we identified typical classroom practices relating to each dimension, not just for one teacher, but for at least two teachers within the case for each aspect to show the, a, a broader range of activities relating to classroom teaching with technology for all teachers within the case. So at least all three teachers were represented in this case study joint display that we created. As wonderful as this was, and what is interesting about this is that a simple thing like reorganizing your scores from high to low can actually be very beneficial in this process of building joint displays because one of the things we learned from looking at this we recognized that there was a trend across the three joint displays that were now created for the three cases for all three cases the content and knowledge score was the highest and it prompted us to reanalyze the data and to look more closely at each aspect and what we recognized was that content and knowledge would naturally be a higher score for everybody because that is something that most teachers would naturally possess. We also recognized that those dimensions, things like content and knowledge and meaning and purpose were not necessarily the best aspects in terms of differentiation of the actual classroom practices. So we decided we needed to take a closer look at exactly Oh, the classroom practices were, were, were aligned with the use of technology. So we took from this joint display those two aspects that we considered critical in differentiating the teacher's actual classroom practices in terms of learner-centeredness and teacher-centeredness. Had we not reorganized our joint display 
to look at the, the scores from high to low, we probably would have missed this pattern that was emerging. And so these little things are actually very critical in building our joint displays. So from this, we ended up doing another iteration that focused on just those two dimensions that we felt were critical in differentiating teachers' classroom practices in terms of learner-centeredness and teacher-centeredness. So from this joint display, you'd recognize that it dealt with not just the two, up, two aspects, but by removing some of those bars and, and the other aspects, we were able to then present in more detail for each case the aspect per teacher. So we were able to present the scores for Richard across his three lessons for lesson dynamics, the scores for Desmond across the three lessons for the very same aspect, and the scores for Rosalind for that dimension across the three aspects. And again, we made sure to bear in mind all of those things we had learned before about joint displays. We ensured that the joint display created also organized the scores from high to low. And when we looked at this, we also had another round of insights. We also learned something else about these joint displays created as we learned more about analyzing our case and gained greater insights into the analysis. What we realized was that within this case, which was supposed to be a teacher-centered case, there was one teacher who was atypical because his scores were much higher and suggesting a more learner-centered approach to teaching. And that would show us that those higher scores are basically not in keeping with his case alignment. And so we recognize that for reader friendliness too, we needed to include an interpretation column. So at a glance, persons could understand what was happening within this case. And so that was another thing that we felt was important in building this joint display, ensuring that we also include an interpretation column that focused on not just identifying the dominance of the teacher-centered or learner-centered approach to teaching in those classrooms, but also looking at the extent to which the teachers within that case that were classified based on their quantitative data actually aligned with that initial case classification. So we're able to look at, from this, case, this joint display, we're able to respond to both sections of our purpose for conducting our joint display. We were able to provide greater insights into how technology was used, aligned with the teacher-centered or learner-centered beliefs. And we were able to also identify the extent to which what they stated in their initial questionnaire about their, their use of technology was consistent with what we actually saw in the classroom. So that was another thing that we learned from building these joint displays. So here you're recognizing that as you go through the different iterations, you will gain greater insights into what is happening with your data. And as you refine that process, it helps you to present a better picture of how your quantitative and qualitative data helps you to gain a better, more comprehensive understanding of your mixed methods study. Next slide, please. So having gained such insights from all the different iterations that we engaged in to build these joint displays, we were now ready to do our overall interpretation of the findings. Now this joint display, what this joint display was based on was not just the mixed methods case study, but actually data collected from the initial quantitative phase that was used to group the teachers into highly teacher-centered, highly learner-centered, and non-aligned categories. So we use the scores from the quantitative phase to build box plots to show how the scores were distributed across the data set. And that was used for the quantitative phase because we were trying to show how these two things, what the quantitative and qualitative phase um, meant for us in terms of overall interpretation. For the case study phase, what we did was to choose for each case study, the typical, the most dominant behavior that was present for each teacher within that case. So you would notice, for example, there's a highly teacher-centered case, the non-aligned group, and there's also the learner-centered group. And each teacher, so all eight teachers who actually completed the case study phase were represented qualitatively. 
And if you look at it also, you'd recognize that we also made use of color coordination, ensuring that the teachers belonging to group one from the quantitative phase were all represented in blue, likewise doing the same thing for the qualitative data that we presented. So that was also a part of considering reader friendliness. We also organized these in terms of distribution from the quantitative box plot, sorry, from low to high, right? So all of these kinds of considerations were a part of this. And of course, the critical role that putting the, the interpretation column in to ensure that our meta inferences were clear. So we were able to discover that within each of these cases, the data for the quantitative and qualitative phase were not always consistent. There were some inconsistencies. So we're able to do that. And we highlighted what were, which date, which persons within the, 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 the each group or case study was inconsistent and we highlighted those words consistent, inconsistent, and so on, just to give a clearer understanding of what this meant for the overall interpretation of our case study and our mixed method study. So here you're seeing that by using joint displays and by engaging in this process, using multiple iterations, you gain greater insights each time that you engage with it. So that means, I mean, there's no, I guess I'll call it, in my view, there's no wrong joint display. The earlier joint displays that you create that kind of have you going, oh boy, these things don't look right. It's a part of the process. And it's a wonderful part of the process when you start to utilize those mistakes you make to fix the next round of your joint displays and to reanalyze your data and to examine it more critically, to think about what the data is telling you in terms of how the quantitative and qualitative data are being brought together to communicate meaning. So each of these errors for me, I found was actually exciting because having recognized the issues, working through them with Dr. Fetters and saying, okay, let's do this, let's fix this, try this, let's put it together this way. What is the data telling you? It actually ended up being a fantastic study where I learned so much from this process. And I think that this is something that joint displays one of those awesome ways of integrating quantitative and qualitative data in your study. Mike, over to you. Okay, so that's great. And, um, you know, there's so much interesting things about what uh, Tashane did. So, you know, first of all, she really showed how the joint display development was analysis. Her understanding of her data was evolving with each different iteration of uh, joint display. So, you know, it's not going to be a one time process where you bring them the qualitative and the quantitative together first, and they're just going to be seamlessly integrated with each other's with each other. Um, second is that uh, through this cycle, all through these multiple cycles of developing joint displays, uh, it really contributed substantially to an understanding to the analytic process um, of many things are not really included in the final publication of results so you know up until now people typically would read a mixed methods article and they would see a joint display and they would say wow this is really great and beautiful and in a published paper you really only get to see the results and you really have no idea about how much work went into development of that uh, joint display and how that really informed what people learned. There's just not space to really write about that. Um, I did want to point out a couple of things that really speak to integration in this study. Um, uh, to Shane's questions for the qualitative case study were driven by the findings from the survey. So she learned information from her survey and she took that information to pose questions of the case study. Uh, some of you may not be aware of language of a qualitatively driven mixed methods case study. So uh, Tashane alluded to how uh, the process involved both quantitative and qualitative data collection in the case study, but it was really more of a qualitatively driven case study. And there's more information about that in the mixed methods workbook or in other places. Um, another unique aspect of this is that the uh, that she relied heavily on a quantitative checklist uh, and observations, which is really important for understanding actual behaviors in the classroom. 
And you can really see how the uh, qualitative information, the quantitative information was linked well by the use of color, which really helps a reader to see where do these different sources come from. So can we go to the next slide? So there are some challenges to using uh, mixed methods joint display analysis. And I think Tashane already alluded to one, which is uh, trying to accomplish too much with a single joint display. You know, you, you end up making multiple joint displays and you realize, wow, there's so much information that we may only be able to, to uh, make as, you know, we can't put all this information to a, a single joint display. We also saw the challenges of making sure that uh, both strands are equally represented, so it's possible for one strand to be underrepresented. Um, there's also concern uh, about how does it align to the actual study design, um, and also thinking a lot, you know, as the as a editor at the Journal of Mixed Methods Research, I really push readers and writers and the reviewers to say, okay, how is the presentation of the research, how is the presentation of the figure, how are the presentation of the joint display, reader friendly or not reader friendly uh, and we often send feedback to authors uh, and say okay you, could you reorganize your figures in such and such a way to make it easier for the reader to understand um, also people achieve varying levels of abstraction in their joint displays in their interpretation section um, and also uh, this does allow for thinking about how do we prioritize the results so if we can go to the next slide, I want to just share with you uh, a really exciting joint display, which has just been published in the Journal of Mixed Methods Research. Uh, this is done by uh, Pierroff and colleagues, where they were looking at place attachment in a Guatemalan uh, Maya landscape, and they used photo elicitation. And so when you see these joint displays, so let me just orient you to them. There are two joint displays here one on the top left and then you know table three and then top table four on the right this all started as a single joint display and you couldn't really see all of the text we have in this very unique joint display the photos we have ratings that they achieve through their study you can see those in those scorings we also see corresponding qualitative quotes and then we also find in the last column for each of them, their meta inferences. Um, and also you can see how the scores are proceeding from the highest score in photo one in table three to a lower score in uh, photo two in terms of their relative importance. So there's a lot of things going on in these joint displays. And this was a very difficult joint display uh, for the author to construct and it was really through the peer review uh, process that feedback on those elements that we introduced on that previous slide came up. So next slide, please. Uh, and I would like to just uh, step in, this is Janet, and say the an open access uh, link to this article is uh, available on Method Space um, if you'd like to take a closer look. And I would like to uh, shift to uh, questions because we're uh, kind of running out of time. So uh, perhaps people can read the conclusions, but why don't we uh, open it up for some questions? And also like to remind folks that um, if you have a question and we don't have time to answer it, please uh, do uh, write in the chat area and we will do our best to um, follow up with a series of posts on method space with uh, answers or links to um, resources that might uh, relate to your uh, questions. So, uh, Michael, what, what do we have in our questions today? Real quick, since we had a uh, sellout crowd, we actually had a sellout number of questions. So we have a, an enormous amount. Um, hopefully we can answer some of these in print later. Let's go to color right away, because that, that seemed very important to a lot of people. So. Color can, uh, it, we got a lot of compliments on, on the use of color, but then it, it creates issues when you submit to a journal and when they're only in black and white. And so uh, is, G, is uh, uh, JDA being disadvantaged when trying to publish an academic journal due to having to use color? Although I see the example that Mike is showing right now is shows color photos. Mike, maybe you can start with that and then go to Shane. Yeah, that, that, that's a good, it's a great question and it, and it definitely comes up. So first of all, I encourage people to look at, you know, when you're looking at a journal, can it be published online or not? 
And if it is, you know, what happens uh, is that the article will be published in black and white in print, but then the online version goes into color. And so, you know, we often are working with authors to say, uh, you know, your, your joint display is going to be in black and white and that you will need to think about grayscale. So you can use grayscale in the, uh, in the submission for the print journal and then use the color for the online version, you know, because the online version doesn't cost anything. There is an incremental charge if you feel really compelled and you have a deep pocket, uh, you can actually pay for a color joint display in the Journal of Mixed Methods Research. But I think it's, you know, for most people, it's prohibitively expensive and um, it, it works fine having it, I think, in the, you know, in the online version. And, and, and that's actually one of the great things about having things online now is that we're not restricted just to just black, white and grayscale, but it involves um, actually submitting uh, two different versions of your joint display. So it's definitely more work, but you, I think it's it's really clear how much that color coding and linking adds to the effectiveness of the joint display. Well, I'd like to just uh, jump in and say that one of the uh, strategies I've seen uh, for this kind of situation is for the author to include, say, media or color photographs and you know colored figures that can't go into, say, the black and white version of the print publication, or in some cases, even the electronic publication um, could be, uh, the link can be provided, you know, in the context of the article. So uh, the reader can find, you know, those uh, other uh, resources. Next question. Um, this one is, uh, I'm going to start with Tashane on, on this one. And uh, the research that you showed started with a, a quantitative effort and then move to the qualitative. And it's, it's, so I'm going to try and write this larger because we've gotten a lot of questions about which wh which uh, methodology takes primacy. It's like for JDA, do we need to start with quantitative or was that just unique to that particular project? That had to do with the design. So remember we have three core designs, the sequential design, explanatory sequential and exploratory and the convergent. So if you started, for example, with an exploratory design, then you would have started with a qualitative um, data, data type first, and then use that qualitative data to inform how you go forward with the quantitative phase. So that has to do with the chosen design. So if you that is what drives whether you use quantitative first or qualitative. Right, so that is one of the key considerations there. And I might just chime in there uh, that that's a great explanation. If someone is still working with their study, you can do what I call trying on the design. So you could ask yourself, would it be more informative to start with qualitative interviews and let that lead us up to a survey or you know some other kind of quantitative quantitative data collection? Or would we be better off because of limited opportunity to actually go into the field, or we, we you know, we may only have a, a brief time window that we really need to collect both types of information at the same time, and what would that look like? Or what would it look like in your project if we started with a quantitative arm first, which was using a survey, and then taking that into qualitative? And so I would encourage people, if you are in the design phase, to think about those different core designs that were that you know to Shane introduced and try them on you know like try them on like clothes do they fit your study and what kind of information would you get back and what would you accomplish by doing that and your questions your mixed methods questions so we have qualitative questions quantitative questions and mixed methods questions your questions will change and how you write them will change based on your design exactly as as uh to Shane pointed out so you both mentioned a couple times that this is a, an iterative process. So is there a, a general rule on, on how many cycle, how many iterations we need to go through before we really are conducting JDA? Do you want to answer that to Shane? <laughs> I would say no. I mean, it depends on the insights being gleaned and what are the kinds of challenges you're encountering and the extent to which what you have done with the joint displays you have created help you to answer your questions. So if you notice, 
it is important to not just build these joint displays, but to look at them closely, look at your research questions that you had created, look at the extent to which they are helping you to answer those research questions adequately. Because if you decide, okay, this study used three iterations, so I guess three is, three is final. I would look at it the way we look at saturation point in qualitative data analysis in some, in some parts. So it depends on when you get to that point where you are comfortable with the displays you have created in terms of how they help you to provide the most comprehensive and balanced response to those mixed methods questions that you have. Well stated, nothing to add. So we have a couple questions on, on, uh, on publishing and it's just like, where do we, where do we include our, our joint data analysis in a, in a paper? Or if I'm, if I'm, uh, working towards a PhD or a master's, where do we where do we include the iterations? Is it in the uh, results section, in a discussion, in an appendix? And I'm gonna, uh, Mike, why don't we start with you? So the finished product is a figure graph table, just like any other paper, and it ends up being in the results. Um, but you can talk about joint display analysis as an analysis procedure. And so if you're submitting a dissertation or you're submitting a paper, you can talk about your mixed methods analysis as joint display analysis. So when we write the method section and the analysis section of a paper, we talk about how were the qualitative data analyzed, how were the quantitative data analyzed, how were the mixed data analyzed, how were they brought together, and that's a place where you could refer to joint display analysis. And again, you know, there's a there's a citation in the mixed methods research workbook that you know you can cite to say this is a legitimate, well-known process. It's actually uh, still very new. Uh, and, you know, and so a lot of professors have never heard of this. So, you know, someone on your committee or even reviewers may be unfamiliar with it. So I think it is very helpful to have, you know, something that, that you can cite in terms of uh, that piece. Now, I also want to just quickly put out an opportunity for people to always think about um, some of the most interesting papers we get come from graduate students, and that's because they're pushing the envelope in terms of methods, in terms of studying these very complex problems that we have, like the COVID era, and what's happening is, as Janet brought into us uh, in the beginning. And so people, you know, really want to know how are you, um, how are you doing that? And so I really encourage people to play with these joint display. They're really fun to create and think about your data and what does it it mean here and you can use these very effectively in your projects in a dissertation uh, oftentimes there's a full chapter uh, devoted to your methods and methodology and so if you're doing a mixed method study i would you know think about a, a qualitative section a quantitative section and then your mixed method section and how are you um, integrating the data and and you may also find uh, the chapter in the mixed methods workbook on integrating during data collection and integrating during data analysis uh, with specific language and terminology and concepts that are used. Well, I, I think the the um, questioner kind of suggests a, another strategy, which is that you know there's some articles and book chapters or books or other publications you might make that are focused on what the results were of the study, but there are also um, methods uh, oriented publications that would allow you to discuss the way that Shane discussed with us today, the process of conducting the study. And, you know, from my view, of course, as a methodologist and working with method space, um, you know, there's a tremendous interest in that, that, you know, researchers, uh, whether they're novice researchers or people who are just trying to experience researchers who want to try something different, uh, it's great to be able to kind of go behind the scenes and see, you know, what uh, the steps were and how you learned from one step to the next. So, you know, I encourage you to think about, you know, more than one type of publication that would allow you to, you know, really make use of um, the different uh, stages of that iterative process that, you know, are just, you know, kind of interesting in, the, uh, in and of themselves, kind of even apart from, um, the discipline or the topic of the study. And I would just add that's the precise focus of the Journal of Mixed Methods Research where I'm the editor with um, Jose from um, Alicante in Spain, 
where we're focused on methodological mixed methods papers. And so we encourage people to submit your innovative methodology to the journal Mixed Methods Research. Thank you for that plug, Jim. And speaking of plugs, um, we're going to have to pull the plug on, on this one. I, I want to thank everyone for joining us and a special thank you to our guests, Drs. Janet Salmon, uh, Mike Betters, and uh, Tishan, Tishane Haynes-Brown. And I want to note the 30% discount code for uh, that's SAGE 2020 for Dr. Fetter's Mixed Methods uh, Research Workbook. There will absolutely be a recording of this um, for those that have been asking. And I know we had some audio problems early on. So there will absolutely be a recording on this that will be sent out. A link to it will be sent out. And we will also have it uh, permanently resident on methodspace.com. So be on the lookout for that email that includes that link and feel free to, to share it around. And please stay connected with, with us at methodspace.com for information on the upcoming webinars that you can see on your screen right now. So again, thank you all and everyone and good day.